The telephone from the Secretary of State's office, the legal counsel to the SOS, Dee Kersey, joins us this morning. Dee, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. Good morning. Happy to be here. Uh, Deke, we had a conversation over the weekend in regards to the process of replacing the two commissioners who were removed in Jefferson County by the three-judge panel decision here. So uh, it's complex. There's a lot of nuances to it, and I felt it would be better if you would actually relay that information than if I were to try to tackle this. Uh, it's a pretty big one to uh, try to bite off here. So uh, let's start first with the decision to remove the two county commissioners uh, in regards to the legal decision, Deke, do you have any interpretations of what you read there that you want to share one way or the other as we set up the process of what happens next? Well, Rob, I think the the, the opinion of the court was pretty clear, which it was a three-judge panel. They, they removed the officials, effective, I believe, on the entry of the order date. Um, so that triggers what's called a vacancy in office. And from there... The county commission, under normal circumstances, has 30 days to find the qualified candidate to make the appointment to the vacancies. Um, but what's interesting, what you and I talked about, is that because of how the vacancies occurred, which was under West Virginia Code 667 for a removal of an elected official, there uh, there's some alternative procedure where the county commission, which is still the governing body to make the appointment to vacancy may have to make a temporary appointment uh, if an appeal is filed while the matter is pending before uh, the Supreme Court. Okay, so let, let's assume no appeal first, and then we'll tackle the what happens if there is an appeal. So n- right. no appeal. What does the Jefferson County Commission do next, if anything? They've got, they have 30 days from the date of the vacancy day one, beginning day one after the uh, the order was entered. And unless it prescribes some other time, which I don't believe it does, but they've got 30 days from that vacancy to make an appointment of someone who's qualified. Code says that qualified appointees under the, that section of code must be registered with the same political party as the members who are vacating. Um, if the appointment is not made within 30 days, well, then the uh, the burden to submit nominations shifts to an executive committee of the political party of the vacating members. Okay. And now, once they create a list, go, go ahead. Okay. Now you, you bring up two things already that raise a flag. So the first and foremost is uh, Jennifer Krause was elected as a Republican switched to mountain party. The West Virginia legislature has introduced legislation. I believe it's been signed into law that says you would have to be, of the party you were elected from and not the one you switched to should the replacement be made. We got into a debate about this Friday as to how that part of this will be completed. What is the Secretary of State's opinion on this, the legal counsel to the Secretary of State's legal opinion on whether you're appointing a Republican or a Mountain Party member in this? Sounds like I'm settling a score. (laughs) So uh, I can tell you that whoever the argument was between, you're both right. Um, but what matters is what's in effect right now. So the state law did change in legislative session to say that when there's a vacancy, that the, the appropriate individual to fill that vacancy is to be affiliated with the party of the, uh, what the candidate was elected as. But that doesn't go into effect until January 1 of 2025. So, and so what we have currently is the same rule that was in place when uh, you may remember Daniel Hall who switched from uh, one party to another while he was in the state Senate prior to resigning. Um, went to the Supreme Court, and the court there said under current law, um, the, way the, law the way the statute is drafted, um, we have to consider the political party of the individual when they resigned or when the vacancy was created, not, as if, not when they were elected. Uh, and so that's the same or very similar language what we have in the county commission vacancy statute in Chapter 3. And so that would be our opinion. You have to consider the uh, political party of the vacating member at the time of the vacancy, not when they're elected. Now, again, that changes January 1 of 25 when that bill goes into effect. Now, part two of this was the executive committee re- appoints uh, the replacement. But does the Mountain Party have an executive committee? They have a state executive committee. Um, but the the Mountain Party doesn't have a a county executive committee, which is what the statute says 
uh, must be the body that makes the nomination. And so there's a big gray area uh, in that question. If the county commission can't fill the vacancy by appointment within 30 days, and the duty shifts or the burden or the opportunity shifts to the county executive committee, how the county executive committee could be constituted for a mountain party that doesn't have one yet. Uh, Denise Binion, the chair of the mountain party, uh, and I have been in contact with each other, um, sort of brainstorming the potential avenues, but ultimately the, the Mountain Party is going to have to come up with a lawful way to do that if it does get to that point. And if they can't, what happens next? Well, uh, nothing, and practically nothing, because uh, the county commission can't appoint a name from a list that they don't have. Um, their opportunity to appoint is 30 days, and then once that happens, they lose that opportunity until they get that list from the county executive committee of that party. So if the list never comes, then they can never appoint from it. Bill? Yeah, uh, Deke, you've raised several, you've mentioned several things. One, you use the word consider a couple so times. I can, I think the definite, uh, my view of de- uh, consider is to contemplate, but you're using a different connotation, are you not? You're using the actual, the, the actual action. Is that correct? Uh, well, well, your your understanding of the English language is is better than mine. I I believe I'm just using the plain version here. Yes, you consider something, you are contemplating something. Okay, so that does not really tie the county commission's arms. They can consider, but if there is not a clear course of action, they take action on something else. Is that correct? Well, in this instance, for filling the vacancy, they can't take action on something that's not properly before them. Um, that was a scenario that came up before the removal, uh, the most recent removal proceedings, uh, where the commission was trying to consider, or, or there were there were arguments made that the commission could um, contemplate to consider the uh, steps that the county executive committee party took to get the names put together to get the list to the county executive committee. There were some allegations that the process the party followed wasn't proper, and therefore the commission could consider those steps in taking uh, and getting that list together. Ultimately, a court said, no, you can't. You need to, uh, that wasn't the removal court, it was another court and another civil action, but the judge has said, basically, you don't consider outside extrinsic evidence. What you consider is the list once it's provided. You pick a name from the list, most specifically once it's provided, but you can't go outside the statute. The solution to this, obviously, is going to be the election. Uh, not considering the appeal, when is the earliest, which election can they, the, the names be put in front of the public? Um, it will be on the general election of this year. Is that right? Because okay. the date of the vacancy is when they occurred. Dee, could they appoint the, um, the commissioner that was just removed? Could the Mountain Party appoint the person that was just removed? Cool. Um, the county commission would be the one that makes the appointment, and I don't know that code actually prohibits someone who's been removed from being reappointed. It's an interesting scenario, but I don't know that I've read the code would prohibit that. Continuing along, Deke, on the process, or did, have you have you reached the end of the process if there's no appeal? Um, yes, yeah, so, yeah, sideways we did. Okay. So it goes on a ballot, and then from there the, the folks elected to the vacancy will serve the remaining of the unexpired term for that office. But the ballot, how does that constitute? Can anybody apply like it would in the primary election? So you could have a general election with 15 people on the, the ballot. Is that correct, Dee? Um, no. I believe when for county commission, and I say I believe because I haven't looked that portion up in a while, I believe the, the statute provides that if the vacancy occurs after what's called the primary cutoff date, which is in February of an election year, but before the general cutoff date, which is in August of the election year, then the political parties for that agent for that um, that county nominate a candidate to be on the ballot uh, in the general election to run against each other. So there's no special candidate filing period like what you would have in some other offices. It's just a, a nomination process by the county executive committee. Again, that's an I believe. I feel pretty confident, but I don't want to say for certain there. Then I'm totally confused. If you, if the uh, county, if uh, the county commission nominates one person to be on the ballot, who is that one person running against? 
the political party, each political party has uh, nominates a candidate to run for that party against the other party's candidates or independents if they file to run. All right. And there's nothing no. in this decision that that prohibits either you know, Commissioner uh, Jackson or Krause from running again. No, this is not, not okay. that I'm aware of. No, and I don't believe they are convicted of any crime that would be prohibited either. It was just a civil removal process. And speaking of civil suits, um, reading through the the decision, uh, scanning the decision, it's it's kind of a, a long haul to read don't, word for word. It, 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 before you take us in that direction, okay. John, I want to stay on the track okay. where we are right, right now. Right which is now what happens now if the commissioners appeal, Deke, and then we'll get into the further pe peeling back the onion on that one. Well, if it's appealed, um, it's what I'm going to call the wait-and-see process. The county commission has 30 days. If there's an appeal, it's still 30 days from the date the vacancy occurred to make the appointment to the vacancies. But it's what code calls a temporary appointment. So the individual they appoint can work up for 30 days um, just so the county can continue its business. But after 30 days, um, that temporary appointee can no longer serve unless there's an appeal. And the panel, the judge panel at the trial level, um, does not suspend its order. Uh, in other words, there's an opportunity for the panel of judges say we will suspend our order pending appeal so the current commissioners would just continue in their duties until the supreme court hears the case and makes a decision based on the rhetoric and the, or the language in the order I, it, which was pretty strongly worded I, I think it's unlikely but you never know what a panel may do uh, and so if the panel decides not to suspend its order it goes to supreme court the way 667 reads uh, the the supreme court uh while their while their decision is pending, um, the temporary appointee will serve up until that decision is rendered. So it would the last it would last much longer than thirty days. Uh, the temporary appointee would just last until the appeal um, is complete. At which point, you go back to the process we just we just talked about um, first, where they have thirty days to make an appointment from the political party of the candidates that are vacating. Deke, the temporary appointment can come from any party, or does it have to come from the party of the person who is uh, appealing? 667 does not say that you have to select someone from any party. Um, and so in the absence of an express provision, I would argue that you could appoint anyone from any party so long as they're otherwise qualified. So in theory, they could, re they could uh, Jane Tabb could say, I would like to appoint a Democrat to this seat or an independent. In theory, yes. There, there may be uh, an obscure court opinion or attorney general opinion from 100 decades ago about this, but um, nothing that I've read suggests, especially in 667, you have to pick from the party, the vacating members, if there's an appeal. Where does it go back to our original discussion that it had to come from the party that you, of the, of the person that that's if left no the appeal. time? If there's no appeal, that's there's no correct. appeal. Okay. Now, Deke, there's no guarantee that the Supreme Court will actually take this, correct? Or, or do uh, they have to take the true. case? Yeah. Okay. I, well, I don't know that they have to take it. Yeah. They'd have to make a decision, but I don't know they'd have to take it. Does it go to the ICM first, and then the Supreme Court, or would it go straight to the Supreme Court as the next level? You know, Rob, I don't know. Uh, I know the ICM's jurisdiction is limited. Um, I would say it does not go there. Uh, because of the nature of the underlying issues, which are these are elected officials who are removed from office, and it's a huge deal for a court to remove someone who is elected by popular vote. Um, so I would I would argue that the legislature, in crafting the ICM's limited jurisdiction, contemplated that a removal proceeding like this may be something that we need to expedite through the appeals process and just stick it right into the Supreme Court. I could be wrong, but I'm not, I'm not sure I can get back to you on that one. John? So looking downrange from this, reading the decision, people were harmed, um, whether it's it's agencies within the county or the, the employees of the agency or people who didn't get the, the uh, various – payments from bonds, bonds and what have you. Do we expect there to be a uh, civil suit fallout, civil suits to be fi filed against uh, 
uh, commissioners Jackson and Krause or against the, the commission itself? I don't know. Um, I believe the original civil suit that was filed by the business owner up there um, resulted in uh, a mandamus uh, where the court or some similar extraordinary writ where the court said to the county, you need to do these step these things, um, force the county to take action, basically. I don't know if there were any uh, civil fines or, or, or reimbursement or some kind of restitution. Um, certainly, it, it may be possible that there may be some immunity there for this for the county. I'm not real sure. Is there immunity or is there coverage? I guess for the commissioners themselves. Uh, it's a that's a big legal question there, uh, and, and I don't know the answer. I do believe that when you're operating in the in your official capacity, um, you you do you represent a, a county entity. Now, when you go beyond that. Um, there are some places like embezzlement uh, or, or other nefarious activities that someone could be held personally liable for. But I'm not sure if, if these kinds of things uh, that are contemplated in the order by the court and the removal proceedings are, are something that would subject someone to personal liability when, when done under their official activities, although they were charged with neglect of duty. Um, so you know, I don't know that I don't know if that would get you out of the realm of protection or not, to be honest with you. I apologize. I'm just not real familiar with that area. There's always a chance, uh, but whether or not it would succeed, I don't know. Deke, the taxpayer dollars via the county commission uh, used, was used to cover the legal fees of these two individuals during the primary hearing. Will that extend to any appeal as well? Uh, logically, uh, it should, uh, although I, I think that it it's more accurate that the insurance policies that cover the, the county would have paid for that. I don't know. It came right out of county coffers. It should have been the insurer. Yeah. But um, it's a good question. Uh, and I apologize I don't know this, but a lot of these are county-specific issues. But I would, go, I, would, I would say probably. Well, and building on that, there were fees of, I believe it was $17,000 that the county commission is now liable for in regards to the bond for one of the companies in Jefferson County that they incurred an expense for while the commission was not meeting to do their business. Is that a potential liability, Deke, for the two commissioners as well, or is that just assumed that it's covered by the county because the commissioners are covered? I would I would assume that it's covered by the county. But again, this is an insurance question, what mm -hmm. the policy covers. But um, it, it's likely that the county insurer will have to pay for that if they agree that they will pay for it. If not, then it will come out of county coffers. Bill, I remember when they were discussing the rain tax in Berkeley County, and I remember doing interviews with Doug Copenhaver. He was talking about if we don't get something passed, there's a personal liability on county commissioners who leave their county open uh, toward certain risk. If they don't balance the budget. And 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 he was specifically cit cit citing that as a reason why they had to come into compliance with federal law. You were a county commissioner. You tell me the nuances of this as best as you can tell, because it seems like in Jefferson County they're kind of butting up against the same thing here. I think the nuance, uh, Rob, is not that they're not liable, but who who covers the liability, the insurance uh, company, and whether the insurance company will accept it or not. The point that Doug was saying is there is state law that says the county commission has to balance the budget. If not, they're liable. What Doug did not address was who would be responsible for paying it. Would the county commission, would the individual, or the insurance? And I think the same thing kind of applies here. Yeah, you can see the tie-in there. Yeah. Uh, Deke, any other thoughts on this situation? Uh, time is tight. Uh, the May election is upon us. We've got less than, what is it, eight days? We have eight days before Election Day. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're, in, we're already in the general election cycle. So the, the, whether there's an appeal or not uh, in the removal uh, matter, um, the individuals that are appointed to those vacant seats won't serve for very long. Um, so I, normally when you see a, a vacancy, whether there's a removal or not, come up. The, the appointees to the seats are typically the ones that are going to be nominated in the uh, general election by the executive committees. Um, I don't know if we'll see that or not. 
depending on whether or not there's a, an appeal, because the temporary successes may not be the same political party as the nominees. So it'll be interesting to see, but no matter what, the county's not going to have um, a vacancy or a temporary appointee serving for very long, um, which is a good thing. You want folks serving in county government and, and across the board uh, in government offices that are elected by plurality, not by, not by an appointment process. So you won't have to wait too long to have your, your, your commissioners back in, in action. Do we know when the criminal trial is set to begin on all of this for Commissioners Jackson and Krause? I don't. I, don't. Uh, I know that there was a special prosecutor appointed. Um, he's from Grants County. It's John Ours. Um, but I have not been subpoenaed yet. I presume that I likely will be uh, similar to my role in the, the civil matter. But um, I'm not seeing a subpoena, so I don't know if there's been a schedule or not. Deke, I'm not quite as optimistic as you are. This is going to be resolved in the next few weeks, a couple of so months. So conceivably, we're going to be going into next year with a temporary appointment. Uh, that's a good, you know what, it's a good question, because I don't know that, that the appeal itself would toll the requirement to put it on the ballot in the general, unless the panel suspends its decision. Deke, part of the defense for the two commissioners was the lack of clarity. In fact, what I think they were insisting there was a, just a lack at all of, of any addressing of a five-member county commission, which only Berkeley and Jefferson counties have in the state. Everything applied to a three-member. Therefore, nearly everything was invalid as, a, as it would apply to a five-member commission. Does this decision strike down that logic completely, or are you even in a position where you would want, want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to comment on it. That was the whole problem, uh, trying to figure out how to solve the, the, the issue of appointing a fifth member of, of the commission when you, you, you have an impasse, a two-to-two -two, um, you know, political battle between who to appoint. And uh, the, the commissioners were absolutely right. Code code doesn't contemplate a five-person commission. It contemplates a three. But where where we missed the mark and the panel uh, in its ruling uh, did uh, provide guidance and some some opinion on the issue is that this was a, a, a situation where you had to do what was necessary to follow a mandatory duty. The duty was to appoint uh, an individual to the vacancy so the county could continue its business. That didn't occur. Um, and for various, you know, excuses, which I believe um, did evolve over time as other things popped up. But ultimately, um, our office gave guidance on how to do it in the absence of code, and that's our role. Uh, under state code, we are, we are to advise election officials, and one of, the, one of the areas of advising would be to solve a vacancy issue when there's nothing in code that gives guidance. So that's what we did. And what we ended up telling them to do is exactly what they did um, after the court ordered them to go back and do it. But all this is a, is a non-issue you know, moving forward because uh, the legislature amended code and added a process for five-member commissions. And uh, so we won't ever have to deal with this again. And that takes place January 1 is when it effectively takes place. I, I believe, yes. I think that's correct. I think that, that statute goes to the Tech Chairman 1 as well. Deke, thanks so much for your time this morning. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Rob. Anytime.